is the next box. And as adults, we do that a great deal ourselves. Well, in verse 12, the man said, All that woman you gave to me, see, it's your fault, God. You gave me this woman. And this woman? Mm -mm -mm. Yeah? And the Lord said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, Ah, oh, the serpent. The serpent deceived me and I. Well, you know the result. It's the curse of pain and childbirth, the curse on the ground, the weeds and great oil to produce crops. You come to anybody's house, this garden in this spring, you can see it. The curse of death, spiritual death, instantaneously because of our sin, physical death, ultimately because of our sin, and also the curse on the serpent. And so God establishes a sacrificial system to pay for what has happened at least on a temporary basis until Jesus comes. The very first sacrifices were made to replace girdles. Right? God said, certainly someone can come up with something more comfortable than a girdle here. But it required the life of an animal or two to do it. And after that, then you have the sacrificial thing that happens with Abel. And his brother Cain. As they bring their offerings. And as you go through the Old Testament period. You see that the sacrificial system is going. Because the scripture says. That without the shedding of blood. There is no remission or forgiveness of sin. Thanksgiving and Black Friday. For there to be thank forgiveness for sin. There must be the shedding of blood. And to be forgiven requires that a person is truly repentant of their sin and wants to be changed. This is something that has to dawn on us before we change our dollar for two quarters. And we change our two quarters for three nickels. That what God is trying to do is to bless us, but we have to want to be different. We have to want to be changed and to allow God to do that His way. Now, if you have your Bible today and you want to look at Isaiah chapter 1, beginning in verse 12, God is going to express to the nation of Israel, after they've been so adulterous and so involved in idol worship and things for now hundreds of years, that they're about to be confronted with judgment and punishment, and, and he's gotten so sick and tired of them coming to church, he actually is telling them, please don't come. I don't want your offerings. I don't want your sacrifices. When you come to worship me, who ask you to parade through my courts with all your ceremony? Stop bringing me your meaningless gifts. You see, if you give your money out of obligation, you just do it because it's no, you know, it's just something we do it and I, you know, who cares? What he's looking for is some expressions of love on our behalf. This time of corporate worship is an expression of love from the body of Christ here at Little Cypress Baptist Church to God. When we give, it should be an expression of love. When we are obedient, that should be an expression of love when we share the gospel. That should be an expression of love. And so he's not looking for us to just go through the motions. Don't just go through the motions this Thanksgiving. Don't just go through the motions this Christmas. It's meaningless gifts. The incense of your offerings disgusts me. Oh, man. As for your celebrations, isn't that what we're about to do? We're about to celebrate Thanksgiving. We're about to celebrate Christmas. We're going to celebrate Easter. Your celebrations, the new moon, the Sabbath, your special days for fasting, they are all sinful and false. I've had a few Thanksgiving steps. I mean, if God was looking at me and expecting to see true gratitude, the Thanksgiving that I celebrated was sinful and false. Because I was just focused on family and food, and, and there was no real focus on the God who had given me that family and that food and made all of those provisions. And so as you see these things, you understand God, He says, I don't want any more of your pious meetings. I hate your annual festivals. I can't stand them. What is he saying? 
It, does he not love them? It, doesn't he want the best for them? Well, certainly as we look on into the passage, we see how God feels about it. In verse 15, when you lift up your hands in prayer, I will not look. Though you offer many prayers, I will not listen. For your hands are covered with the blood of innocent victims. Innocent victims. Yeah, we're taking advantage of people. We're using people for our own good. We may not uh, be loving and caring toward. We may hate people. And, and we're guilty of murder in the eyes of God when we hate people. And so he says, wash yourselves and be clean. Get your sins out of my sight. Give up your evil ways. Ah, you see, the problem is not that he doesn't want the people. He doesn't want their sin. Why? Because they've taken their dollar and they've given it up for two quarters. And they've given up their quarters for three dimes. And now they've given up their three dimes for four nickels. And there they are just before the time of judgment with five pennies in their hand. And it's our sin that is it's creating this kind of situation. And so he says, learn, learn to do good. It's not just do good. Do point credit, you may not like that, but you have to learn to do good. Where are you going to learn it? You're going to learn it from the Word of God. You're going to learn it from brothers and sisters in Christ who you are in accountability with that are walking with God and they're doing what's right and you're joining them in that process and you're showing your love for God and you're learning to do good. You're seeking justice that what happens in your life, in your circle of influence, in your nation, that it's just, that it's right, that you're helping the oppressed, those people that we keep praying for that are all around the world, that are Suffering persecution. People are in grave need uh, for food and things like that. Defend the cause of the orphan. Now, there are more orphans around us than you may realize. And I've made this point before. You find a school teacher who is teaching school today. And you ask them how many children in their classrooms are basically raising themselves. They may have a parent in the home. That parent may not be there. There are some places where kids are actually the most responsible person in the home. And they're actually raising their parents. Who are constantly on drugs. And this child is having to feed himself. Brothers and sisters try to take care of mom and dad or whoever's in this condition. I, Look, we, we are here to defend the cause of orphans, whether they have parents or not. And to fight for the rights of widows. You see, if you were a woman on your own in biblical days, that was not a good place to be. If you didn't have any sons, if you had daughters but their husbands were not willing to take care of you, uh, you were in an extreme poverty situation. Our faith and trust in Christ should make us the kind of people that not only are thankful and do celebrate the things that God has done, but causes us to push out and to go do for others. That's why you see the shoe boxes over there. That's why we're trying to bring together $7,000 for the Lottie Moon Christmas offering and so many things that you may be doing within your classes. But we're individually responsible to take care of some of these things as well. He goes on to say, come on now, let's settle this. Says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, I will make them as white as wool. His goal is to forgive their sins and to wash them clean. And that is what he wants to do. For those of you today who have never given your life to Jesus Christ. You've never been saved. You've never surrendered your heart and life to Him. He has taken those of us who still struggle in life from time to time. Still deal with issues in our life. But because we put our faith in Jesus to save us and not in ourselves. We've repented of our sinful way of going away from God and have turned to God. He has provided cleansing for us. He has provided forgiveness of sins. And without that 
cleansing through Jesus, you will not make it. Verse 19. I want you to notice in this passage, it goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. Doesn't it? If you will only obey me. Isn't that what Adam and Eve chose not to do? Isn't that what Satan tricked them, deceived them into believing that they were going to be blessed by not obeying? They traded their dollar for two shining quarters. If you will only obey me, you will have plenty to eat. Oh, there's Thanksgiving. No, that's our condition as a nation. You see, this nation used to be very dependent and focused on God. You see, if we don't obey, we're ultimately going to find ourselves in a situation where our nation will not have plenty to eat. We've been trying to encourage our church family to prepare for such circumstances, not so that we can afford something, but that we can be a blessing to others in a time of need. But if you turn away and refuse to listen, you will be devoured. See, on one hand, you obey and you have plenty to eat. On the other hand, if you turn away like our nation is turning away from God, it's not that you have plenty to eat. It's that you are eaten. Devoured by the sword of your enemies. I, the Lord, have spoken. So we keep these things in mind. For as we think about Thanksgiving and Black Friday, we know that there's forgiveness of sin through the shedding of blood, that it requires that a person truly change to be repentant of the sin in their life and want to be changed, and that the sacrifice of animals pointed to a much more important sacrifice that has come, a very special lamb that we hear about in Hebrews chapter 9 in verse 11. We're not going to read all of this, but you understand this is about Jesus, who has become our high priest. If you're a follower of Christ, you give your heart and life to Him. He is our high priest. And He is the one who has done this, not through the sacrifice of the blood of animals, but as you notice, with His own blood. With His own blood. He entered the most holy place 